Okay, thank you very much. My name is Zita Mokomani from the Department of Sociology at University of Pretoria in South Africa. My contribution will be on confronting the challenges of migration. Some of the things I'll talk about might be general, but it's uh, the focus is on Africa. So before I start, maybe first things first, we can look at the concepts, what migration is. Um, it's a demographic process, the others being fertility and mortality that adds or subtract, subtract from the members of um, population or society. So the more people migrate into an area or a population, the more the population size will be. And also when more people migrate out of a population, there will be fewer people. The same thing with fertility. If there are more beds in a, in a society, it means that the population will grow. And if there are fewer, the population will decrease and with, my, with a mortality the same way. So what's the, uh, the definition of migration? Demographers define it as a change in residence across some geographical boundary in a given time. So there are three basic conditions that a move must certify to be considered a migra migration. It must involve a permanent or semi-permanent change in one's residence. So if you are going to move to a province to visit a family member or a friend, that's not really migration. You, the intention of the move must be to involve a permanent or semi-permanent change in one's residence. So semi-permanent would be, for example, someone moving to a crossing a job political boundary, either a country or a province or a district in a country to go and study, for example, for some time for a semester or for an academic year, or to go and work. And that's the intention, but the final intention is to go back to your place of origin. You must also cross some administrative boundary, like I've said, it could be an internal boundary in a country or an international boundary. And it must occur over a given period of time. So you might say migration over a year, migration over six months, or migration over five years, and so on. So those are the concepts that might make the, some of the, the, the discussion relevant. So why do people migrate? The theory is that there are two types of two fact, factors that are obviously an array of factors that make people migrate, but we can categorize that into two. We have what we call push factors and pull factors. So push factors are factors are things that we want someone to move out of a, a place. So you can imagine being pushed out of your place of origin. And usually these are negative circumstances, for example, poverty or fear of prosecution or conflict or whatever, and it's pushing you out of your era of origin. And natural dis disasters, climate change, um, disasters, flooding, droughts, uh, tsunamis, whatever it, it, it is that can make, make your place of origin no longer conducive so for, for residents and you move. Things like socioeconomic uh, issues like unemployment, lack of jobs, crime, or whatever it is, and you are pushed and they actually make you make the place of origin very difficult to survive in and you, you are pushed in. The pool factors are, in a way, the opposite of push factors. They pull you to an area. So you probably are facing fear of crime, fear of natural disasters, but the, you'll have an array of places where you, you could move to. And it's also a conscious decision. You decide, okay, where I'm living is not really conducive. Where do I want to move to? I'm unemployed, where do I want to? So you look at areas and find those that have factors that can pull you towards something like safety. You might think, okay, this district in a, in a country is more safer than where I live, or this country I feel is relatively more safer, that's where I'm going to, to go. So the safety in that area of destination is some is what is pulling you to that area. Opportunities, it could be educational opportunities, employment opportunities, and so on. And that those pull you, they make that the area of destination very attractive. Stability could be economic or political stability, and you run away from the fears of 
political instability in your area of origin and go to where it's more stable and just freedom in various factors. So those are basically the two factors that determine migration. So when we come to Africa, usually the picture that we see from media, from social media, uh, mainstream media and social media is um, a picture of desperation. It seems that uh, people in Africa migrate, usually the push factors are more fear, are more poverty, are more, and those two pictures on the slide are just what I think most of you would normally, it normally comes to mind when someone talks about migration in Africa. And this has led to a number of calls and actually, uh, or a number of uh, commentations from different uh, scholars and, 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 and people. Their fl flocks and dehas in 2016 wrote something like, say, Africa is often seen as a continent of mass displacement and migration caused by poverty and violent conflict. Influenced by media images of massive refugee flows and bold migration, and alarmist rhetoric of politi politicians suggesting an impending migration evasion. The portrayal of Africa as a continent on the move is linked to stereotypical ideas of Africa as a continent of poverty and conflict. And I think that really uh, summarizes what these pictures usually portray about Africa. Um, the, uh, the other uh, observation by Paul Ikuomi said, for millions of African migrants and their families, like others in the world, moving to another country offers a chance of better life with benefits extending to future generations. Yet, beliefs about international African migration are arrived with misconceptions that they have become part of a divisive, misleading, and harmful narrative. And I think what this is just saying is that even though Africans might also be moving like uh, other parts of the world for opportunities and things, the stereotype in the media and social is that Africans are always moving because of poverty or are running away from the continent, not necessarily that it's a free migration. As a result of this faulty thinking, and which is often an up, often inaccurate information about African migration, many migrants in destination countries have become victims of violence, xenophobia, and other forms of abuse and human rights um, violations. Here, there are pictures of what happens a lot in many countries. I'm based in South Africa, so I'm using a lot of images from South Africa. In 2008, there was the infamous xenophobic attacks, and since then there have been sparks every few years where, out of desperation, citizens will blame migration migrants for lack of jobs, unemployment for crime and things. And just this year, in 2022, the Picture below Operation Dubula, there was an organized operation, if you want, where people said we are really just going to um, chase away mig migrants from South Africa. And this is usually what is happening. And currently, right now, there is a big public debate what happened about three weeks ago with the Minister of Health in one province was shown on social media, really taking a migrant from a neighboring country and blaming the migrants, saying that it's because of them that the health system in South Africa is under, under, under strain. So it's not just the, the ground, but it can also go up in the policy level where some top government officials usually blame migrants for this. And uh, this, uh, misconceptions, the major misconceptions that usually lead to these uh, uh, um, unfair attacks, I would say, on migrants. There are, there are a lot of them, but Gold and Kevin we have said um, we can categorize this into five broad uh, misconceptions. One is that migration is something new. The other is that most Africans are leaving the continent for Europe. That's why we get all those pictures of people migrating or on the boats and drowning and so on. Most migrants are poor and fleeing from, the, from poverty and conflict, like the previous quotations show that is not 
they, they, they usually the narrative is that migrants are fleeing and they're running away, it's not because they have, they are skilled and they have opportunities elsewhere. Another misconception is that migrants take jobs and opportunities away from citizens of receiving countries, and in the process they drive down wages. So citizens can actually get better wages because they're competing with migrants who are ready to receive very low wages. And that's usually the case, or the, the arguments in countries like South Africa when this xenophobic attacks occur. And then another misconception is that one, once they arrive at their place of destinations, migrants never want to leave to go home. So they bed in the, the destination country system, social systems, and so on. So I'll go through one of the, each one of these and just show how this has been counter-argued and also trying to bring in, in terms of the, the family, how this has been affecting families. The first my misconception that migration is migration is something new. We have a lot of data that shows that mig Africans have a long established and rich history of population mobility. So people have always been moving in Africa. Uh, in West Africa, for example, there is evidence of migrant workers from countries like Burkina Faso, from Ghana, moving to mining sectors, especially economic sectors of other countries, neighboring countries. Labor migration to South African mines and farms has been a long established phenomena in Southern Africa. And for a long time, there were migrant labors from Botswana, Lesotho, Mozambique, Malawi, and other Southern African countries to work in there. It has reduced a lot, but it's still happening a lot. Uh, and the table on the on the right there just showing that since the 1960s up to the 2000s, you can see that migration has been a really a major part of the social landscape in Africa. And most of it occurs within Africa, like I was saying, Southern Africans will leave, move, move, migrate mostly to South African mines because South Africa was more advanced then, was the most advanced in Southern Africa and Ghana, in West Africa as well. What I think this slide is trying to say that what the next slide is showing that migration in Africa is mainly interregional. So the misconception that most Africans want to leave for Europe is, the, the, or the narrative that most Africans live for Europe is another misconception. Data has shown that migration has always happened interregionally and within countries. Current estimates are that around 21 million documented Africans live in another country. And I highlighted documented to also talk about that um, another often cited notion that most Africans are undocumented or illegal migrants, but they are documented and live in another country. So Obviously, some do move out of Africa, that's a fact, but it's not always to Europe. We saw the Gulf countries are getting an increasing number of Africans in, in the Americas as well. So African migration is not always irregular or illegal movement, but most Africans move out of their continent in possession of valid passports, visas, work permits, study permits, and other travel documents. And where there is conflict, usually it's asylum seekers or refugees, and these are documented. The graph on the on the on the right there is also just a recent statistics trying to show what I've just been talking about. The Misconception that most migrants are poor and fleeing from poverty or conflict. The counter argument that is that migration itself is a costly process that requires financial and social capital. So you need actually financial resources to be able to move. And you also need usually need social networks where you are moving to. So when you move from one country to the other, you have to find a family or friends or other social networks to help you settle there. So it's not easy. So the poor are not necessarily the ones who can migrate most of the time. So what it's saying that, although it will be impossible to deny the importance of conflict as a force, as a cause of forced migration in Africa, 
It is also equally wrong to neglect social processes that drive mo mobility, such as a search for education. So in most countries, people want higher education, but in their own countries, it's just not possible. Or the, 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 a particular type of education that you can get, postgraduate education, STEM, technical education, and you move to another country to get that, not necessarily because you are poor, but because you want something better. Like, um, refugees and people in refugee-like situation, basically in distress situation, represent only about 14% of international migrants in Africa. So the point here is that majority of international migration within Africa or inter-regional inter migration in Africa is really for better opportunities by people who have the skills, who have the financial and social capital, and is not always related to COVID, to co conflict and poverty. We are not denying that conflict does play a major role, but it's not the only. So, I'm, so those pictures that I showed at the beginning are really that misconception. Another misconception, the, the fourth misconception that, that migrants take jobs and opportunities away from citizens, which is often the driving force be, behind the xenophobic attacks, uh, has been counter argued that generally, migrants generally take jobs that either the citizens do not want to take or they do not have the skills to, to take. Many Africans move into another African country usually uh, have what they call critical skills permits to try and fill the critical skills that are not available in that particular country. It's exactly same as what is happening when migrant, African migrants move abroad, usually it's to fill skills that the, the countries can either don't have or they have a, a problem feeling. So I put a star there because uh, those that, the job that citizens don't usually take also come up come often with a lot of exploitation because um, they are looked upon by citizens or they are usually poorly paid and things and migrants do take those those jobs but also when they move they do participate in the economies because they create additional demands for goods and services so they are contributing, even though they have moved, they are contributing somehow indirectly by paying rents, by paying taxes to national accounts and so on. So that's another point. And the fifth and final one, that once migrants are, are, arrive at their destination, they will never leave. Many migrants to the contrary are migrating for semi-permanent purposes. They go there for studying and the idea is to go back home or elsewhere after studying or to work and then go back home at retirement or when they have achieved their career aspirations. But the rules and regulations and costs of crossing borders often make it very difficult for migrants to go to return home. Just the processes, the bureaucracy, really do restrict uh, uh, departure and into so the same rules that often restrict access into a, a country of origin or of destination are the same rules that also restrict uh, force migrants to circle in that country it becomes just too cumbersome to return home so it's not because they they want to stay in in that country but they are just forced by the bureaucracy and and circumstances and this became very uh, clear during COVID when countries around the world put in places and movement restrictions, we found tens of thousands, thousands of migrants detained in crowded and unsanitary conditions and then they were deported and they couldn't go home because of lots of bureaucratic processes. Many reported exploitative um, human rights abuses, including theft of their wages, being coerced into more exploitative because they couldn't go anywhere. Um, extremist groups and my criminal networks actually pounced on those vulnerabilities and they be be benefited financially by controlling migrant smuggling and trafficking routes. So sometimes when migrants are really vulnerable to go home, they fall pray to these criminal networks to say, you pay me this so that I can cross you over the border. Or and when you're a migrant, the vulnerabilities make you even more vulnerable. So 
Well, with all those challenges and all those misconceptions, that also this also lead to a number of family challenges for migrant families. It means that um, migration, we said, has and as um, as is not is nothing new. It it has always happened. There is a lot of literature, especially in countries like South Africa, how the migrant labor system had a major impact on union, marriage, and familial, inst familial instability and dissolution. What happened at the most um, my labor migrant processes, only the, the, the migrant worker is allowed to move. So family migration is not encouraged. So people sign contracts of about nine months to go and work in the mines. And in that nine months, with mine mining, mining, mining labor migration, for example, which was the men who were living. So they will leave um, their families in the rural areas or in the neighboring countries and have to go and work for the full nine months, the minimum nine months in the contract. And in that case, you can't go home. Um, and that led to a lot of instability because they come back home after there's a, obviously either the unions are, have issues and they dissolve or they find issues there. And as a, over the years, we have also seen a lot of women also migrating and this extracts and when women, because women still play a major caregiving role in families in Africa, by migrate, migration then removes carers from families and this, um, increases the burden on women who remain in the area of origin because they have to, they still have their production functions. Now they have more added family and care and other domestic responsibilities. These are usually aunts, grandmothers who have to now look after children while the women in the labor market migrate for, 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 for work. And um, it has also weakened um, intergenerational and reciprocal caregiving relations because the family, extended family in Africa played a major role. That's one of the functions where the extended family uh, provide caregiving relations with families. As, as people are moving, one, okay, the, the, um, there's extraction of care resources, household sizes become smaller, and things like that. And this, uh, we see, we have seen, uh, even though these uh, relationships or caregiving, traditional mode of caregiving is still existing, it has really weakened. So, another is social cause such as emotional strain resulting from separation of members for obviously and because migration also is a long process, it's interregional, like I said, and then coming back home is usually. Um, hampered or made difficult by the, all these processes at border, at ports of entry. Some people take a long time before moving home. It's very common, for example, in South Africa, where there's a high number of, especially we, migrant women who are working in the care and domestic sector industry from countries like Lesotho, Zimbabwe, Malawi, who have been home away, away from home for almost three years and yet they have left small children there. And you can imagine the, how that, the, the emotional strain that goes with that, but they were forced by circumstances to go. And trying to go home, what, the first thing that usually happens, I've talked to some of them, trying to go home, they will always think, okay, I'll go home, but coming back is going to be a, a real problem at the border. So what is better? Rather, if I, I send the resources home and stay here, but it comes with um, emotional strain, both for the migrants who have left families behind and the families who have stayed home behind and they miss on important family events like funerals like weddings like children's uh, rise to passage and so on so unregulated migrant process make a um, migrant vulnerable to exploitation through poor working conditions so these are because they come trying to document them usually is also a process so many migrants work under re, re, very poor working conditions because they are not regulated and the employers know that they're very little recourse so 
they can easily violate labor laws that are paid lower wages. They have limited or no so access to social security. We saw during COVID-19 when most countries put into place mitigation measures to try and cushion their citizens from the impact of the pandemic. And it was very clear that it's just for citizens. In some countries, migrants were taken into consideration. For example, in South Africa, it had to be, they put in a, a, a temporary relief grant for people, uh, it was means tested, but it was for citizens and permanent residents. So if you're a migrant, you are not eligible for that, but the, the pandemic did affect everyone equally. At the same time, we also need to recognize that even though there are a lot of challenges that migrants in Africa face, uh, migration by itself um, provide remittances that pro uh, provide um, a financial lifeline to millions of households. So migrants live mostly for opportunities, economic opportunities, and like I said, or for educational opportunities. And most of them do send remittances that take that take various forms. They could be clothing, mostly money, especially in foreign exchange and foreign exchange, money, groceries and things. So these remittances are used for an array of things for food security, mainly. People can at home can buy food to pay uh, children's school fees, to pay family health care access. They facilitate health care access where out of pocket health care is a major thing for clothing. And many migrants use this for investment, for family investment, buying property or family homes, livestock acquisitions, which where a livestock is a major form of investment. So they're very important. So we're not saying migration is a bad thing, it's a good thing, but at the same time, it's also bringing some challenges that I've discussed. The graph on the, on the, on the right, they're just showing the number or the proportion of, of uh, remittances that may, different African countries receive. And you see, can see that it's a lot for countries like, for example, um, South Sudan, over 34, about 34%, over a third of GDP was coming from, from, from uh, uh, remittances, mi migrant remittances. So it's a very important form of financial capital for most families left out left in the place of origin so having said that it's very important to confront the challenges that migrants in africa face so that we don't we are not going to stop migration but we must also make it really visible and and, and comfortable for those who who migrate and their families so a safe regular and orderly inter-african migration must be a priority because currently now labor laws especially make migrants very vulnerable so improve labor law policies that allow migrants to move and to take advantage of economic opportunities in other countries is a very important so that um let's make it um possible and also safe and regular and orderly for other migrants to move freely from one African country to the other, then we'll stop those um, unfortunate incidences like xenophobic attacks, the myth that migrants are taking jobs from citizens, the, the labor policies that make migrants really vulnerable to labor exploitation and fair labor, Policies, social security, we talked about that many Afri Af migrants move and work years in a, in a neighboring country and one retirement they go back home, they can't even take back their social security or, so, or their pension back if they have it. So trying to improve those policies so that migrants can enjoy the same labor rights as citizen workers that could make it safer. There have been talks about an all African passport for free movement. It's a difficult one and there are lots of debates around that, but I think it's, a, it's one way that the debate should continue and we see how it can really work. Then last but not least, one of the major challenges with uh, migration is that um, the 
there's very limited data on migration, on the overall dimensions of migration. And I think that this is what leads to some of these challenges because we really don't know what we are dealing with to say. So it will be good to have macro data very good robust data that can allow robust mapping of migration patterns to and from within Africa over time to say where are migrants going and what are really the, the issues that where what, how are they go uh, what are the reasons for moving from one area to the other and this can also give fundamental insights into the factual evolution of African migration. What is really driving this? What are migrants? And most importantly, I think, what are migrants bringing to areas of destination so that it's appreciated? Right now, in many African countries, migrants are seen negatively. But I think if citizens can see that they see migrants as actually uh, 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 in a positive light, this can um, address some of the challenges that African migrants face. And then this can also help see to what extent this, some of these misconceptions are valid. And then the, such data, the evidence base will be important for to inform policy making and, and scholarly debates around migration dimensions. And I, because the, here we are really interested in issues around family, then, I think them also talk about issues uh, th that affect migrant families. So most of migration right now is individual, but we are seeing that as slowly we, there is an increase in family migration and the dimensions around that because that is what is leaking, leaking right now. So thank you very much, and I think uh, this is just the base for further debate on on migration in Africa and more specifically on family migration. Thank you.